Okay, hello everybody. Can you let me know if you can hear me? I'm talking now. I see Liz, Constance, and Catherine. Okay, I got one yes. Good. How about Liz and Catherine? Can you hear? Catherine can hear. Okay, Liz, can you hear? Okay. Um, Eve is in and Ashley. Can you hear Eve and Ashley? Ashley can hear. Okay, how about Eve? Can you hear? Okay, good. All right, Justine, I think you can hear, right? Can you just give us a yes if you can? Justine, can you hear us? There she goes. I think she's okay. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so we're going into a new unit this week. Um, we're going into the consumer math unit. And so we're going to um, go over, I think, three sections tonight or two sections? I can't remember. Let me look at my notes for a minute. Hmm, I think it's just two, isn't it? No, it's three. Okay. So 10.2, 10.3, and 10.4. So I hope I have everything loaded. I might have to add something else in, so I hope it's all here. Okay. All right, so 10.2 is personal loans and simple interest. And so what we're going to learn here is how to use a simple interest formula, and then we're going to use a rule called the United States Rule to help us solve some of the interest problems. So let's just talk in general about a personal loan. So what's a personal loan? So the amount of credit that you can get or the principal that you could borrow um, is dependent on the insurance that you, the assurance rather. Okay, Eve, um, is it still fuzzy now? Not sure I can do much more with my headphone. Okay, you want me to put it back? How's that? Is that any better? Okay. Um, so the amount of credit you can get depends on a lot of things. You know, your credit score. And also, sometimes we give the bar, I mean the lender, some security. So, for instance, if we buy a car, um, the security there would be the car. So if we don't pay the loan back, the, the borrower can come and take the car away. And we call that security or collateral. Sometimes on, when we buy a house, we put a down payment. Um, so a personal note is the document that gives the terms and conditions of the loan. And sometimes the banker, if your credit's not good, they might require you to have a cosigner, somebody else who could guarantee that loan will be repaid. So let's talk about interest. And interest is the money that the borrower pays to use the lender's money. And this section is going to be on just on simple interest. And this is the entire amount of the loan for the entire period of time, and that's the interest is calculated a single time. And that's what we call simple interest. And it's simply this formula here. The principal, the amount you borrowed, times the rate. And the rate, although the bank is going to quote it as a percent, we're always going to convert it to the decimal and then amount the, the uh, time period, which is generally going to be in years. And again, there's what they are. Um, the time can be in days or months, but most of the time we're talking about years. And the most common type of interest, again, is called ordinary or simple interest. Um, and on this one, we're going to assume that each month has 30 days 12 months in a year or 360 days. And on the due date of the simple interest note, the borrower must pay the principal back plus the interest. So let's take an example. Sherry wants to borrow $6,200 to replace the roof on her home. She's going to borrow from her credit union a 30-month loan with an annual simple interest rate of 5.75%. We want to calculate the simple interest she's charged. So how are we going to do it? So we need to know the principal. She's borrowing $6,200. Uh, the interest rate was 5.75, which again we convert to the decimal. Yes, divided by 100. Absolutely, Justine, she's right. We're going to take that 5.75 and divide by 100 to get the rate. And then the time, remember I said to you, we generally always go to years, so they quoted 30 months for her loan. We're going to divide by 12 to get the number of years, which is two and a half years. And then you just plug it into the formula. And if you just multiply this out on your calculator, you'll come up with $891.25. 
Um, and by the way, this is about the only formula that I really require students to know. It's a pretty simple formula. The other formulas in this chapter will be provided for you on the midterm. And obviously, if you're taking your um, test, your unit test at home, you can use your notes. Um, but you do need to know this one. Interest equals principal times rate times time. Okay, so there's her simple interest. And then the second part of the question is how much does she have to pay back at the end of the 30 months? So she has to pay back the 6200 plus the interest. And so we just add those together and she has to pay back $7,091.25 to pay for her roof. So pretty straightforward. Simple interest. Now, sometimes there are things called discount notes. I don't know how popular these are nowadays, but in this one, you pay the interest when you get the note, when you get the money. You pay, it's like paying the interest up front, and it's called a discount note. And the interest charge in advance is called the bank discount. So let's give you an example. So Seagreed uh, took out a $500 loan using a 10% discount note for a period of three months. Determine the interest she must pay to the bank when she gets the loan, and then the net amount she'll receive, and then the actual rate of interest. So even though it says 10%, um, it's actually going to be a little different. Let me show you when we work it out. Okay, so the interest she must pay is, she's getting a 10% is the interest rate, and she's borrowing for three months, which is a quarter of a year, and she borrowed $500. So same simple interest formula. So she's got to pay $12.50. So what's going to happen when she goes to the bank to get the loan? She's not actually going to get $500. She's going to get $500 minus that prepaid interest. So if she really needed $500, she actually had to borrow a little bit more because she's paying the interest up front. So she only gets $487.50. So now the question is, what was the actual interest rate? It wasn't actually 10%. It's going to be a little bit higher. Now we know what she paid in interest, we know the principal, and we know the time, so we're going to we're going to solve this equation for the actual rate. And a clue again, it's always going to be higher than the quoted rate because she's paying the interest up front. And if you go through here and simplify on the right side, I took 487.50 times 3 divided by 12 and I got 121.875 R, and then I'm going to divide, divide both sides by that number and I come up with an interest rate of about 10.3 percent. Now remember I mentioned it's going to be a little bit more than the interest rate that was quoted because she's paying the interest up front. She doesn't actually get all that money. She only gets um, the $500 minus the prepaid interest. Okay, questions on that one. So that was a little bit of a different calculation. You're using the same formula, but you're calculating now for the interest rate rather than uh, for the interest paid. Okay, Justine has a question. Go ahead. Um, well, you could use the 3 over 12 or you could use 1 over 4. Either one, it doesn't matter because you're, you're always, this formula generally always goes to year. So it quoted three months. So three months is three out of 12 or one quarter of a year. Either one will give you the same answer. You could also use the decimal if you want. You could put this as 0.25. Mm -hmm. Eve said it. Yeah, 0.25 would be fine. It would be the same thing. So whatever feels more comfortable. I just want to make sure on your calculators you're able to do the calculations. Yes. So Justine's comment, actually I didn't click the last one here. Yes, multiply this by 100, and then we came out with 10. Again, it depends on what the problem asks you how to round it, but if they want a percent answer to one decimal, it would be 10.3%. Again, remember, it's always going to be a little bit higher than the original interest rate. Always higher on this one. All right, so United States rule. Good, she's happy now. Good, Justine. <laughs> the United States rule was a rule that talked about what happens when you make a partial payment. So it says that if a payment that is less than the full amount owed is made prior to the due date, it's called a partial payment. And the Supreme Court decision specified the method by which the payments are credited, and it's called the United States Rule. It, it states that if a partial payment is made on a loan, interest is charged um, from the first day of the loan until the date of the partial payment which kind of makes sense. 
and um, the partial payment is used to pay the interest first. We always have to pay interest first, and then the rest of the payment is used to reduce the principal. This is actually important if you have a mortgage. Um, some people send in extra payments, and so when you send in a little bit more than the payment, first they'll pay, make the payment for the interest, and then they'll apply it to the principal. The balance due on the maturity date is found by computing interest due since the last partial payment and adding that to the unpaid principal. And the banker's rule is used to calculate that simple interest when you're applying the rule. And again, this considers that the year has 360 days and any fractional part of a year is the exact number of days of the loan. And so there's a table in your book, and I put it up here. Um, actually, oh, here it is here. Um, what it does is it shows you the, the month, the day of the month and the month, and then tells you what day of the year it is. And that helps you when you do the calculations. So for instance, um, December, Third is the 337th day of the year. And sometimes you need that. I think I have some problems coming up to show you. Yeah, here's one. Determine the exact time from the first date to the second date using that table. So we want to go from April 18th to November 11th. And so if we look in the table, I've got the table over here, November 11th. So if I go to November and I get down to the 11th across here, it's the 315th day. So that's what I put here. And then I want to go to April 18th. So if I pick that up, April 18th is right here, 108. Oops. Too many, too many screens up today. And that's 108. Now then all I do is subtract. So there's 207 days in between. I'm not really asking him much on this kind of calculation because it can get pretty complicated. Um, determine the due date of a loan now. You could use the same idea. You're taking a loan on July 5th for 210 days. All right, so again, we want to look up on the table and see where July 5th is. So if I go here to July 5th, it's the 186th day of the year. All right, and we want to go ahead 210 days. Takes us to 396. There's 365 days in the year, so we're going to subtract it to get because we're going to go to the end of the year and then start again. So how many days into the new year do we have to go? 31. And so that would be January 31st for the due date. So again, these are not real difficult. Um, and that's all I gave you on that section. Simple interest and then a few calculations on the things like this, the dates, due dates of a loan or the dates between. So I didn't really make it go into the partial payments. Yeah, I know, but when you're doing the due date of a loan, you actually use the 365 days of the year. If you look at the table, it actually goes to 365. But when we talk about calculating interest, we generally say each month has 30 days. I know that seems a little weird, um, but when we're doing interest calculations, they're going to just say each month has 30 days. But when we're actually counting days of the year, it does go to 365. And also, we're not going to worry about leap years on your problems to make it, again, easier for you. Um, okay, so compound interest. So this gets more complicated, and this is really the way the world works. So we're going to learn in here about compound interest and present value of an investment. Alright, so an investment is the use of money or capital for income or profit. In a fixed investment, the amount invested as principal is guaranteed and the interest rate is guaranteed. In a variable investment, neither the principal nor the interest is guaranteed. Sort of makes sense. Um, let me get back for a minute. Variable things are things like mar money market funds and things like that. Fixed investments are CDs at a bank. So compound interest is where we compute on the principal and any accumulated interest from the prior period. And we call that compounding. And here's the formula that we're going to use. Um, let me put the click to get all the definitions up. So A is the amount of accumulated interest, total accumulation, the principal plus the interest. P is the principal. R is the interest rate again as a decimal. T is the years. And then N is the number of compounding periods in a year. Sometimes we compound monthly, quarterly, could be daily, whatever. But we're going to calculate that, use that in our calculations. All right, so let's try a simple example here. Kathy invested $3,000 in a savings account with an interest rate of 1.8% compounded. So as I start reading this, I want to say to myself, what information do I need? I need a principal. I need the interest rate. 
I need the compounding and it's monthly. And then I want to know how long, two years. So as I'm working the problem, I'm saying to myself, which pieces of data am I going to use? So I've just written them down here. Principal, 3,000. Interest rate is a decimal, 0 0.018. Compounded monthly, so N is 12, and two years. And then I drop all those numbers into the formula. All right, now, um, if you took an MAT 1100 class, we did formulas like this. We're going to start right here, inside the parentheses. Remember, order of operations. So what I did was I simplified that number in the parentheses. Let me go back. I took 0.018 and divided by 12. And I think I might have multiplied that exponent at the same time, because that's a pretty simple calculation. No, I didn't. Okay, so all I did was do the R over N. Then I'm going to add 1 to it. Again, this is the way to do it in your calculator. And then I'm going to, now I've got this quantity here, and it's going to be raised to that exponent. In this case, it's 24. So again, in my calculator, I never have to stop here. I've got this number in there now. I'm going to use my exponent key. Now you're going to need to figure out on your calculator. Um, many calculators have a key like this. They have a Y to the X key. Um, if you've got a TI-83 or 84, it's got a key like that over on the right-hand side. A little up tick thing like that, which means go up to the exponent. But you need to figure out on your calculator how to do that calculation. So you're going to raise this number to the 24th power. And I've got the intermediate steps here for you. Notice I've got approximate because I'm rounding when I write the numbers down. And then the last thing I'm going to do is multiply by 3,000. And again, in my calculator, I did all those steps without ever writing anything down. I didn't really need to stop along the way. So again, go into the parentheses, R over N, do that calculation first, add 1, then raise it to the exponent, and then finally divide by the principal. That's always going to be the last calculation. So at the end of two years, there's going to be $3,109.88 accumulated with um, that interest rate that was given to us. What was it? 1.8%, I think. Yep. And it was compounded monthly for two years. All right. Now, this formula will be provided for you. You do not have to memorize it. Um, the effective annual yield, um, I actually have updated this formula a little bit. It's actually, um, it's correct here, but we can write it all together. It's actually this quantity here minus one. And what this is telling you is because of the compounding, the interest rate quoted is actually a little bit higher. So we're looking at and saying, what is a simple interest rate that would give us the same um, yield? So let me show you an example. Determine the annual percent yield if we put $1 in for one year at 2% compounded quarterly. So I'm going to take that formula I just had, put 2%, 0.02 over 4 for compounding quarterly, raise it to the 4 times 1 for one year. Again, start right here. Add 1. And I'm going to raise it to the 4th power. And then the last thing I'm going to do on this one is subtract 1. So the simple interest that it co corresponds to 2% compounded quarterly, again, this number is always going to be higher than the interest rate you started with, is 2.02%. And if you compounded it monthly, it would be even a little bit higher, and if it was compounded daily, it would be a little bit higher. So this is the yield you'll see the banks, you'll see them on the signs. It's a 2% it's a CD with the annual yield of 2.1%, something like that. Um, that's where it comes from. All right, and then next we have present value. This is how much do I need to put in now in order to come out with something later. So present value, what we need to put in now, amount is the amount to be accumulated, interest rate is R again, and then N is the compounding periods, and T is the time. So let me show you where you would do something like this. Will wants to save money for his daughter to go to college, and he wants to invest enough in a CD now to pay for for expenses which he thinks will be $30,000 in six years. How much should he invest now in a CD that has a rate of 2.5% compounded quarterly? All right, so again, pick all the pieces out. Um, and I actually just put ahead and put them into the formula. So 30,000 he needs. This is the one plus R over N simplified. And it's compounded monthly and he's doing it, I'm sorry, quarterly, quarterly for six years. So 24 compounding periods. And if we simplify that, we come out with, he needs to put in about $25,833.30 in order to have $30,000 accumulated in six years. OK, 
Okay, so it's the same formula you had, just solving for the principal rather than the amount to be invested. All right. Now, I was afraid of that. I didn't put the other section up. Just bear with me for a minute. I've got to find 10.4. I thought I put it up and I didn't, so just bear with me. Um, I'm still here. I'm just looking for the next section. I thought I had posted 2.3, 2.4. Here we go. There we go. Um, Justine, I have a problem remembering compounding, quarterly, etc. What do you mean by that? Picking up the words from the problem to tell you the compounding? Okay, semi means twice a year. Quarterly means four. Yeah, you're just going to have to remember these, honestly. Um, monthly is 12, quarterly is four, semi is two. Um, I don't think I gave you any daily problems. You really only need to remember semi, which is 2, uh, monthly is 12, quarterly is 4. So you really only need to remember three of them. I don't think I gave you any that were... Um, I'm trying to think if I gave you any dailies. I don't think I gave you any daily problems because it gets really big exponents then. Well, if it's only, hold on a second now, she's talking about something different. You're talking about, Liz, you're probably talking about a simple interest formula where they said they invested it for three months, so it's going to be a quarter of a year. That's going to be the time factor. But when we do compound and we look for the wording that says how frequently is the interest going to be compounded? Is it going to be compounded semi-annual? Um, is it going to be compounded monthly? So two different kinds of questions there, so be careful not to confuse those. Because if you get one that just says three months, it's generally just a simple interest problem. It's not going to be talking about compounding then. Okay. All right. So 10.4 we're also going to do today, which goes along with what we just did, is installment buying. So this is real similar to what we just talked about. But now we're going to do something where you're going to make fixed payments over the course of the loan period. So this is like a car loan or a mortgage tuition, boats, things like that. So up front, you go to the bank and you say, I want to borrow $15,000 for 15 years, and they'll calculate what your monthly payments are, um, and you'll pay the same amount each month. Now, you could have an open-ended installment loan where you make variable payments each month. This is like um, credit cards. So when you use your credit card, you're not borrowing a fixed amount of money. You're going to the store and making a purchase, and then you actually as long as you make the minimum payment, you can actually decide how much you want to pay back each month. It's not fixed. And a couple, just a little history here. Truth in Lending Act requires that the lending institution tell you two things. The annual percentage rate is the true interest charge for the loan and the total finance charge that you have to pay back. And in addition, if you know in a couple, a couple years back, um, there were some changes made where if you get your credit card bill now, it'll tell you how long it's going to take you to pay off the balance if you make the minimum payment. And sometimes it's a little shocking if you have a big, of a big balance. Um, and the total installment price is the sum of all the payments and the down payment. Um, and here's a little table that we sometimes use looking at the number of payments and the interest rate. And then this is used to calculate the finance charge. We're going to use a formula, but we're also sometimes using the table, and this is per 100. So if you borrowed $1,000, let's say it's 6.5% for 12 months, this is the finance charge per 100, so you multiply that by 10 because you borrowed $1,000. So again, we can use a formula, but we can also, if we only want to know the interest, we can use that table. So what we're going to do here is figure out the monthly payments. Now the pieces in the formula are very similar to pieces you've seen before. Here's the principal that you borrow. Let me just click here. Um, here's the interest rate. Um, here's the com or the number of payments per year now. Instead of compounding, we're talking about payments. And everything you're going to work on, I'm pretty sure, is 12 payments. Each month you're going to make a payment. Um, the important thing to notice in the denominator is the negative sign here. If you miss that negative sign, this number is not going to be the correct number and you're going to get the wrong answer. This formula you can't really do all in one step. Um, so what I might do is I might do the numerator because that number is usually not too difficult. 
do the denominator, and then do the division. So let's try an example. So Kristen wants to purchase new window blinds for her house and they cost $1,500. The home improvement store has an advertised finance option of no down payment and 6% annual percentage rate for 24 months. And we want to calculate her monthly payment. So what do I need? I need the amount she borrowed. I need the interest rate, 12 payments, she's paying monthly, and it's for two years. Here's my formula. I'm going to drop my numbers in. And I'm trying to let's go to the next page for a second and see what I did. Okay, so I simplified the numerator and denominator. Let me go back. So what I did was I took this 0.06 and divided by 12. Down here I took 0.06 divided by 12 and added 1. So if I can click back over here. Now again, notice that negative. Don't miss that negative in that exponent. Then I can simplify the numerator and denominator. So this again, the numerator is usually a pretty fair simple number, so 7.5. Notice in the denominator, the number that comes out of this part here is always less than 1. It has to be or you're going to get a negative answer, which doesn't make any sense. And then do the subtraction, and then finally divide. So her monthly payment is $66.48 for two years in order for her to pay for those, um, was it blind she bought? I can't remember what she was buying, shades or something. Um, so that's her monthly payment. It's a fixed payment every month for two years. The interest is built into the payment. All right, questions on that? The most important thing for you is to figure out um, how to use your calculator. I think that's the most critical part. The formulas, again, will be given to you. Finding the numbers to put in is not difficult. Where students have the trouble is using the calculator. So get your calculators out and check and see if you can get the numbers that we're getting here in the slides. All right, so now we want to figure out what her interest rate, our finance charge was. Now there's two ways you could do it. You could take her total payments, multiply by 24 and subtract the amount borrowed, or you could also use a little table here. So if we remember, she was borrowing uh, $1,500 and her interest rate was um, 6%. For 24 months. So this is how much she's paying per hundred dollars finance. Again, we're talking about the finance charge. So now we have to figure out $1,500 is 15 of those $100 increments. So we're just going to go ahead and multiply that quantity by 15. So her total interest was $95.55. And again, you could also take her monthly payments, which were, let me go back and get her payments. Let's just type this in so I can show you. It'll it'll come out approximately the same. 6648. Just bear with me, it didn't type right. There we go. So her monthly payment would come up with 6048 times uh, 24 payments. And then if we subtract how much she borrowed, it should come out to pretty close to what I got there. So let me see what I get. 6648 times. Uh, 24 is 1595.52, and then if we subtract the 1500, oh, shoot, and then subtract the 1500, you see it's pretty close to what the table gave us, 59.52. It's off by a couple of pounds, oh, no, not 59, 95, Ugh. sorry, 95.52. So notice it's pretty close to the table um, because the table's rounded off a little bit. We actually did the actual calculations here, uh, but pretty darn close. So you can either use the table or you can actually, the table's easier. But if you've already figured out the monthly payment, you have this information already. So you have two ways to do that. Okay, let's do another one. Um, Ilga's purchasing a new computer, monthly plan. $14.95, she put 5% down and she paid $64 a month for 24 months. Now, different information this time. How much finance charge did she pay? All right, so the amount financed is the purchase price minus the down payment. So she didn't finance the whole $14.95 because she had to put 5% down. So how much did she actually finance? 5% of $14.95, if you multiply it on your calculator, $74.75. 
So what did she actually finance? Subtract that from the purchase price. So she financed $1,420.25. Now, again, we could use the table, or since we know what her payments are, let's go ahead and use the payment information. $64 a month times 24 months is a total paid of $1,536. Subtract the actual amount finance, or financed, and she paid $115.75. So another way to do the problem when they're asking you for the finance charge, you can either use the table or you can use the calculations based on the monthly payments. Okay, and then I'm going to do another thing on this problem here. They want to know what was the APR. Now we this is why we couldn't use the table because we didn't know the interest rate. We want to know the interest rate though to the nearest half percent. So, so to, now, to use table 10.2, we need to divide the finance charge by the amount financed and then multiply by 100. All right, so we know her finance charge was 115.72 divided by the amount she financed, multiplied by 100. So now we're coming up with the number that's going to be in the body of the table. And let me show you what you're going to do now. So if you take a look, if you round that off, it comes out to be about 8.1, 8.2. And remember, she went for 24 months. So if I look across 24 months, the closest number here is 8.00, so she, her f interest rate must have been 7.5%. So this is kind of a back way, because we didn't know the interest rate, in order for you to figure out what it is. So the APR was actually 7.5%. Okay. And just to finish up, um, I don't believe, oh, I did give you one. Okay, I've given you one question on this part. Open-ended installment loans. These are like credit cards. Okay, so you, um, this is a popular way of making purchases or borrowing money. And the credit card is going to tell you the in annual, peer I'm sorry, daily periodic rate on purchases and on cash advances. Notice the cash advance is always higher, obviously and then the actual annual percentage rate. And again, these are going to vary depending on the credit card account and the localities and so forth. But this is also going to show in your credit card bill. And typically the credit card monthly statement will show you this, the balance at the beginning, the balance at the end, the transactions for the period, the statement closing date, the payment due date, the minimum payment due, So again, might tweak your curiosity to look when you get your credit card bill if all these things show up on your credit card, because they will. So for purchases, there's no finance or interest charge if there was no previous balance due and you paid the entire balance by the due date. The period between when a purchase is made and when the credit card begins to charge interest is called the grace period, and it's usually 20 to 25 days. However, if you have a balance, they're going to start charging you interest on the new purchases right away. So. Um, one reason, if you can, to pay your credit card bills off. All right. However, if you use the credit card to borrow it, there's generally no grace period, especially with a cash one, cash advance. And the finance charge is applied from the date you borrowed the money until the day that you repay. All right. So let's just try an example here. John's credit card to company determines his minimum monthly payment by adding all the new interest to 1% of the outstanding balance. The credit card charge is 0.039698% per day. On March 17th, John uses his credit card to buy plane tickets for $2,600 and he makes no other purchases. So we want to find his minimum payment on April 1st. Okay, so remember, there's a grace period in there. So he's not going to pay any interest on this uh, $2,600 plane uh, ticket until after the next due date. So when the the 1st of uh, April, he owes 1%, $26. Because again, remember that grace period. He didn't have any balance on his credit card when he bought the tickets. So they're not going to charge interest on it until the beginning of the next billing cycle. So he owes $26 on, Mar on April 1st. Now, instead of making the minimum payment, he makes a payment of $500. Assuming no additional charges or cash advances, determine his minimum payment on May 1st. All right. So his new balance now, he paid 500 bucks. So his new balance is $2,100. All 
and he has to pay 1% of that, which is $21, but he also has to pay interest for the month of April on the $2,100. Now, this is where, Eve, you asked me that question before. They're going to assume every month has 30 days. So that's where we get into this idea of the days of the month. So $2,100, his balance, times 30 days. Now, remember, the interest rate was given as a percent, so we had to, again, divide by 100. So it becomes a tiny, tiny number. So he also owes $25.01 in addition to the $21, the 1% minimum payment. So on May 1st, he's got to pay $21 bucks plus the $25.01, and usually they'll round it up to the next whole number. So he'll pay $47 on uh, May 1st. Now, obviously, this gets very complicated if you make additional charges during the course of the month and what you're paying interest on and so forth. So I just gave you some simple, simple problems to do. Um, with minimum payments. So I'm not going to make you do multiple partial payments and stuff. So you don't really have that very difficult homework on this section. All right, so that was 10.4. Yeah, that's the end of 10.4. So um, lots of formulas, but again, I can't stress enough, you need to be able to use your calculator. And this is why I think it's so critical that you get a calculator and bring it for your proctored exam so that you're comfortable with the calculator. Um, you can't use a cell phone calculator on proctored tests, um, and you can't really use the calculator on the computer. So get yourself an inexpensive TI-30 makes um, less than $10 at Walmart, a little simple calculator that will be useful. If you have to buy one, you want to make sure it has an exponent key, and parentheses are also very helpful, and also a square root key for some of the things that we do. All right, so questions. So I tried to hit each kind of problem that you're going to see um, when you're working on your homework. And again, this is all on consumer math. So next week we'll do um, oh, mortgage payments and uh, annuities to finish out the chapter. All right, anybody have questions? Summer moves fast. And I just posted your grades from last week, too. I sent an email out today with all that, too. Okay, good, E. Constance Brittany, just taking it all in. I know. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Okay, and then this weekend, I'll be opening up the midterm module for you um, where there's a practice test that you can use to get ready a practice I call it a preparation quiz to help you get ready for the midterm okay um, yeah Justine I understand that um, you all got an email about signing up making your reservation for the midterm is that correct because we don't faculty don't see the email that goes out um, and there is a module now in our course called Proctor Testing, and in that it's got all the links for you. I'm going to send a message this weekend. Actually, probably on Friday I'll send it out. But if you want to look, um, okay, maybe the email even had the links in it too because I didn't see it. So, um, But there is a module now called Proctor Testing on our table of contents, and it's got all the links. Um, if you need to make an appointment on campus or you need to... Um, if you're a distance student, you need to get a proctor approved, or if you're going to use Proctor U. Yeah, it'll tell you what to do. It's not hard. I would suggest making an appointment, though. Well, your, your Proctor test is going to fall on, let me just check the calendar. Your dates are um, the 16th, 17th, and 18th of June. So it's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you get to pick. What's the matter? We're coming up. It's fast, I told you. Um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you get to pick the time for the appointment. Yeah, I know, it's only, summer is very, very short. It's only 10 weeks. So we're start. this is week three now. Week four, week five is when you have the midterm. So it goes really, really fast. Can't fall behind. So your midterm will be on, um, what was your guys' first stuff? Oh, numeration systems and now the con consumer mass. So you have two modules for the midterm. Oh, she can do it. Justine can do it. She's my perfectionist. Believe me, she can do it. <laughs> she, I had her on campus. She's a great student and she's a perfectionist. So. And by the way, I loved your golden ratio tooth example. That was fabulous. I have to share that with some of the faculty because we never thought about teeth. 
so it was great. All right, guys, if you're all good, I'm going to check off. And um, again, we'll chat again next week, and we'll finish up the um, consumer mass section. So everybody have a great week, okay? Good night.